you got your Bibles, let's hold them up in there. Say, this is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I will do what it says I can do. Today I will be taught the Word of God. I boldly confess. My mind is alert. My heart is receptive. I'm about to receive the incorruptible, indestructible, ever-living seed of the Word of God. I'll never be the same. Never, never, never. Never be the same in Jesus' name. Well, you know, the Bible has a lot to say about... Oh, by the way, how many people are being baptized this morning? One, two, three, four, five, you have two. So, so we have several being baptized. Awesome. Baptism over there, too. Did they tell you that I hold you down until I'm absolutely sure you're serious about it? <laughs> no, I'm just teasing. But, uh, 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 and I want you to leave this week after this. We're going to do baptisms again next Sunday. You may have somebody who doesn't want to become a member of a church, doesn't want to be tied to a church, uh, but they want to really illustrate that they believe in God and they have a relationship with Christ, and they can come and get baptized. Uh, sometimes people don't baptize in churches unless you're going to join their church. I don't care about that. What I do care about is that, that you know Jesus. And so if you've got friends that want to be baptized, this will be a great time for them to come next week and get it done too. Amen? So we'll have baptisms when I get done here this morning. I want to talk to you about vision. Not the type of vision that you may have for your life, but the fact that, that God still works through dreams and visions and things like that. And I'm going to talk to you about a vision that actually changed this world, made a big difference. God called the people of Israel to a special relationship with him. We call them God's chosen people. They were his people, his witnesses, his missionaries to the rest of the world. But somewhere along the way, they got mixed up and started thinking that, that because God has given them the law, that they're the only ones that matter. Matter of fact, they got to the place where they called Gentiles dogs. And they, they decided they didn't want anything to do with the Gentile. They believed that even if you bumped up against a Gentile, you would need to go home and ceremonially uh, cleanse yourself, wash again, before you went out in public. So they really had a whole group of people they weren't going to do. Large of the areas of the world would never have heard about Jesus Christ if people had the attitude today that I'm just not going to deal with certain people. But I'm going to talk to you about how wrong it is to have an attitude that there's a whole group of people I'm just not going to deal with. And uh, because you have to have a pretty exalted attitude about yourself to think that you're that much better than everyone else. Amen? Because you're not. I don't want to disappoint you. You're saved, but if you're judging somebody's loss, like a, you, need, you have forgotten something, that when Jesus went to the cross, he cleansed everybody. Now, not everybody that was cleansed by what happened on the cross will go to heaven. Why? Because some people are not going to accept Christ as their Savior. But he did deal with the sin problem uh, uh, t over 2,000 years ago. Amen? And so the problem is with the church many times today is we still have a whole group of people that we say, I'm not going to minister to them. I don't like them. So I'm not going to hang around them. I'm not going to do anything with that. You know, you got to change that attitude. Uh, the fact that Peter was willing to stay in the home of Simon the Tanner, and that's, we'll read that in a, in a minute, proves that God was gradually moving Peter away from his, his man-made legalistic attitude. Uh, let's start in Acts 10 in the New Living Translation, uh, uh, and we'll do uh, the, the first eight verses. It says, In Caesarea where there lived a Roman army officer named Cornelius who was captain of the, uh, of the Italian regiment. He was a devout, God-fearing man, as was everyone in his household. He gave generously to the poor and prayed regularly to God. Now, right now, if you just heard that, you'd say, well, he must have been saved. He wasn't saved. We're going to see that. There are some people that are really religious. Now, let me tell you, their spirit doesn't desire God. Do you know why? Because before you accept Christ, your spirit is dead to God. The only thing that can help something dead is to have life breathed into it. That's the only thing that can happen. So his spirit wasn't seeking God, but in the soulless realm, in your mind, will, and emotions, he was already... Uh, trying to seek God. He was praying. He was giving to the poor. He was doing those religious things. How many people know there are people that will not make heaven who are very religious? Amen. 
But he was a devout, God-fearing man. He knew that God existed. If you read in Romans 1, you'll find that there was a whole group of pagans that knew there was a God, but chose not, not to serve him, not to accept Christ. And, uh, and, and Paul the Apostle said, they're without excuse because God has revealed himself. The Godhead has revealed in creation. Anyway, he says he was a devout, God-fearing man, as with everyone in his household, he gave generously to the poor and prayed regularly to God. One afternoon, about 3 o'clock, he had a vision in which he saw an angel of God coming toward him. Cornelius, the angel said. Cornelius stared at him in terror. What is it, sir? He asked the angel. And the angel replied, Your prayers and gifts of the poor have been received by God as an offering. Now send some men to Joppa and summon a man named Simon Peter. He's staying with Simon a tanner who lives near the seashore. As soon as the angel was gone, Cornelius called two of his household servants and a devout soldier, one of his personal attendants. He told them what happened and sent them off to Joppa. Cornelius was a member of a military regiment, and he was actually over a hundred soldiers. Uh, he was also portrayed as a godly man. We're told that he was devout. This means that he knows that there's a God, and he's seeking him. We're also told that, the f uh, that he fears God, and that he lives his life as if he's answerable to God. And that, that means that he's very religious, sincere, and prayerful, and yet he's not saved. There are many people today who think that all you need in order to make it to heaven is to be religious. But being religious won't do it. I've said this a million times. You can attend church every Sunday here. You can give of your tithe. You can get to work inside the church. But until you have come from the place where you're no longer an unbeliever and now you believe in Jesus as your Savior, you're still not saved. You need to accept Christ as your Savior. Amen? The angel who appears to Cornelius tells him to send down to Joppa for a man named Peter who's staying in the house of Simon the Tanner. Cornelius' story sheds some light on that question. What about the person who's never heard of Jesus Christ? What about the person who's lived up to the light that he has received but has never heard of Jesus Christ? What happens to him? Well, what happened to Cornelius? Because he was seeking God and he was operating in the light that he had about God, God sent him more light so he could come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Amen? Uh, when he was obedient to the light he had, God, God took care of that. I believe it's safe to say that a person anywhere in the world who sincerely wants to be right with God, sincerely searching for the truth, can find that truth. God has ways that we know nothing about of getting his word to those who truly seek him. Someone asked Charles Spurgeon if the heathen could be saved uh, if they did not hear the gospel. His, his wise reply was this right here. Yeah, but can we be saved if we don't deliver the gospel? Are we really saved people if we're not telling anybody about Jesus? I think there's some signs of somebody that knows Jesus as their Savior. They want to serve God. Amen? We don't want to talk about that anymore. We want to say, well, it's, all you had to do is go forward and say a prayer. If all you had to do was go forward and say a prayer, there's, then, then that'd make it... Uh, uh, a little bit ridiculous, wouldn't it? I'm going to go forward and say a prayer. Father, right now in the name of Jesus, I don't want to burn in hell. Well, that's not turning from the old life and turning to the new life, is it? But there is getting saved, which just means that, that I've decided I'm no longer going to be an unbeliever, but I'm going to believe God. And the Bible says something happens then. Then we're no longer born of corruptible seed by our, just mom and dad in the flesh. Now we're born of incorruptible seed by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. It means according to Colossians that we have moved from the kingdom of Satan to the kingdom of God's dear son. We're no longer operating in the principles of the world, but now we're operating according to the principles that God set forth. Amen? So let's move on and go through verses 9 through 16. The next day, as Cornelius' messengers were nearing the town, Peter went up on the flat roof to pray. It was about noon. And he was hungry. But while a meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw the sky open. Something like a large sheet was let down by its four corners. In the sheet were all sorts of animals, reptiles, and birds. Then a voice said to him, Get up, Peter. Kill and eat them. No, Lord, Peter declared. I've never eaten anything that our Jewish laws have declared impure and unclean. But the voice spoke again. Do not call something unclean if God has made it clean. I want you to remember that. Because he really wasn't just talking about something to eat. Peter comes to understand 
that, that he has a separation that's going on inside him where he believes he's something special and, and different than everything else. Peter was one of those raised uh, as, a, as a good Jew and believed if he even touched a Gentile, he'd have to go clean himself. So he didn't want to, uh, he didn't want to partake of anything that was against the, uh, uh, the law of Moses. And yet the law, part of what we call the law of Moses, the true law that God handed down was Ten Commandments. And man has a way of taking that which God had made was so pure and making it more complicated than it has to be. Amen? And uh, so here comes the same vision was repeated three times, then the sheet was suddenly pulled up to heaven. But, but what was the message God gave him? Don't you call unclean that which I've already cleansed. Amen? Have you ever wondered why Peter was so horrified at the thought of killing and eating unclean animals? Why not just pick a clean animal from the ones that were unclean? Because there was clean animals in those four, in, uh, in, in the sheet that came down, and unclean. Why didn't he just pick out the clean ones? But he couldn't do that. You know why? Because he was so covered up religion, he knew that if, those un, uh, if the unclean ones had touched the clean ones, then the clean ones weren't clean anymore. And there might be some people here today saying, well, I believe that's a little bit true. It's never true. I'll never walk in and find somebody who don't know Christ and suddenly find myself a sinner because I bumped into them. Saints still become sinners when they bump into other sinners. They don't, they don't do that. And I want to go ahead and tell you, give you this little tidbit. Uh, uh, quit calling yourself a sinner. I get tired of people saying that. I'm nothing but an old sinner saved by grace. Shut up. I'm a whole lot more than that. The Bible calls me a saint. I'm a separated one. Amen? I'm not the same thing I used to be. Our identity has changed. Amen? The clean animals mingled with the unclean. And if for a devout Jew, the mingling of the clean with the unclean would have caused all the animals to be unclean. Because of his upbringing, that really upset Peter. Peter's response to God's command to kill and eat was, Not so, Lord, for I've never eaten anything that was common or unclean. He's proud of the fact that he's never done certain things. Do you know how many Christians today are sometimes proud because they haven't done certain things? They're prideful about it. I've had people tell me this. Well, I have never drank a cup of coffee. Well, shut up. I drink it all the time. I'm making up for what you didn't do. <laughs> I've never smoked a cigarette. You probably got great lungs then. I've never smoked pot. Well, hallelujah for you. I smoked and didn't inhale. No, that's not true. I, me I remember the time I went to the doctor. He said, you got spots on your lung. He said, I, well, let's, let's watch that. I said, I know what that is. He said, what is that? That's cemetery weed. He said, cemetery weed? Yeah, when we couldn't afford to buy anything, we used to go to the cemetery and cut the wild marijuana that grew out there. And it was kind of harsh. <laughs> so that probably caused spots on my lungs. And I've been, been right because there's no spots on my lungs anymore, so... There's nothing wrong with not doing certain things, but what is wrong is defining our spirituality based on the things that we refuse to do. Like, like I knew one preacher used to say, I don't cuss, drink, smoke, or chew, and I don't run around with women that do. Well, that sounds pretty good, but the truth is that the world is not impressed by that. What non-Christians are looking for is the Christian who's able to live a life that's beyond the capabilities of the non-Christian. Where they can look at and see there's actually a difference in the life that we're living than in the non-Christian's life. Amen? I want to live a life that's light where people in the darkness can say, man, I'd like to have what that man has. Amen? The Lord's response to Peter in this vision is what God has cleansed you must not call unclean. Now, some people say, well, now how does that relate to people? I understand that. Well, you need to understand that, that even Peter understood that, that uh, he's not talking about just animals here. Because he's getting ready to go see Cornelius, and Cornelius was a Gentile. 
So God had to change something in, inside of Peter for him to be able to go minister to a Gentile when normally he wouldn't even go in their house. Amen? And we might think that that's kind of uh, harsh for Peter to have that attitude, but I'm here to tell you right now that many Christians have that attitude. Many Christians today have that attitude. They weren't raised as, as Jews against Gentiles, but they have other attitudes. I talked about the, the, the racism that I heard in my house when I was growing up that I didn't even recognize was racism at the time. In, the, in one of the towns I lived in, there was a white pool and a black pool. You ever hear of that? We had a swimming pool that the white people swam in, and then not a block away on top of the hill was the black pool where the African-Americans swam. Huh? Wasn't no brown pool. We didn't let them go anywhere. No. In 1994, when my father passed away, I went to the cemetery there in Enid, Oklahoma. And at that cemetery, the guy who ran the cemetery told me, he said, I, just don't, I don't want you to be upset. I want you to see that even though your dad's grave is close to the colored section, it's not actually in the colored section. My response wasn't Christian, but I said, well, dad don't give a rat's ass about where his body is right now. He don't care. Makes no difference to him. Well, I just wanted you to know. Well, it don't make any difference to me either. That ain't nothing but old body, and I don't care where it is. My grandmother was a very loving woman. She went downtown. Uh, Ian at Oklahoma came back and told my mother, I saw the cutest bunch of little pickaninnies there. So I remember asking my mom, what is a pickaninny? And she said, well, it's a little black child. I said, oh, Lord. And can I tell you something? I, I, I grew up in a loving family. They didn't understand it. My dad was anti-Martin Luther King Jr. He said he's a troublemaker. One of the biggest fights we ever had was over that. No, he's not. He, he cares about peace and equality. He's a good man, Dad. Oh, he's just causing trouble. No, he's causing some change that needs to come around, and we had a major fight over it. But I was raised, and people didn't understand. Did, did you know that if you'd have asked any of my relatives who were professing Christians, is there a group of peop people that you don't want to deal with, they might have put African Americans down there, Native Americans, Mexican Americans. I don't know. I'm just being honest with you. Now, what other group is there? I have a pastor friend who to told me that he won't allow a homosexual to come to his church. And I said, you've got a pretty good-sized church. Can I go tell you this? You have homosexuals in your church. Well, I don't know about it. Well, it's probably a good thing. You see, we don't put our stamp of approval on sin but Jesus uh, uh, paid for sin, so God the Father said, Don't you call unclean that which I have already cleansed. And all sin was dealt with on the cross. Amen? The same people that are mad at one group, they won't be mad at every group, just the group that they're mad at. See, this is the, this is the way it was with Peter. Peter wasn't mad at everybody. He, was just, he just didn't want to hang around anybody that wasn't exactly like him. Does that sound familiar to some of us? I wonder if Peter thought about the words Jesus spoke in Mark 7, 17 through 23. Uh, I'll read that to you. When he had entered a house away from the crowd, his disciples asked him concerning the parable. So he said unto them, are, are, are you thus without understanding also? Do you not perceive that whatever enters a man from the outside cannot defile him? Because it does not enter his heart, but his stomach, and is eliminated, thus purifying all foods. And he said, what comes out of a man, that defiles a man. For from within, out of the heart of men, 
proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile a man. In other words, being near pagans is not the problem. Being like pagans is the problem. I remember when I did a, uh, a biker funeral a couple of years ago that was a great big biker funeral, and we, and we had the, uh, the fellowship time afterwards. It was at a bar, so I went inside the bar, and when I was coming out, one of the bikers, they just called me Rev. You know, I've been around a long time to the biking community, and one of them said, uh, uh, Oh, watch out, there's Rev. And the other guy said, no, no, he's cool. Hey, Rep, come on over here. So I went over there, and he said, you want to hit on this? I said, what's wrong with your head? How long have you known me? Have you ever seen me drink a beer? Have you ever seen me uh, uh, smoke a joint? Have I ever done any of those things around you? No. I'm not starting today. But the reason they respect me is because I make a stand for Christ, but I don't condemn them for what they do. I didn't tell them they couldn't smoke it. I don't care about it. But I'm not going to smoke it. Amen? You can make a stand for righteousness and not condemn other people. Does that make sense? We need to love on people. Isn't that what the Beatles said? All you need is love. All you need is love. All you need is love, love. Thank you. In the 17th verse said, Peter was very perplexed. What could the vision mean? Just then the men sent by Cornelius found Simon's house standing outside the gate. They asked if a man named Simon Peter was staying there. Meanwhile, as Peter was puzzling over the vision, the Holy Spirit said to him, Three men have come looking for you. Get up. Go downstairs and go with them without hesitation. Don't worry, for I have sent them. This is for all the people that may be here that think the Holy Spirit doesn't talk to people anymore. He still does. He said, I'm the Lord and I change not. So Peter went down and said, I'm the man you're looking for. Why have you come? They said, we were sent by Cornelius, a Roman officer. He's a devout, God-fearing man, well-respected by all his Jews. A holy angel instructed him to summon you to his house so, that you can, so he can hear your message. So Peter invited them in to stay for the night. The next day, he went with them, accompanied by some of the brothers from Joppa. Look at how God dovetailed working in Cornelius and in Peter. For while Peter was praying and seeing his vision, the men from Cornelius were approaching the city. While Peter was still perplexed about the meaning of what he'd seen, they arrived at the house. While Peter was still thinking about the vision, the Spirit told him that the men were looking for him and he must not hesitate to go with them. And when Peter went down and introduced himself to them, they explained the purpose of their visit. When the Lord shows us some new truth, I want to tell you this. He gives you an opportunity to walk in that truth. Here, God has just revealed to him that he shouldn't be prejudiced against this one people. Shouldn't be prejudiced against the Gentiles. And now, he was going to have the opportunity to use the knowledge that God had revealed to him. Amen? You ever notice that? I'll preach a message here, and I'll say, now the test is coming when you leave here, and it does, doesn't it? Starting in verse 24, they arrived in Caesarea the following day. Cornelius was waiting for them and had called together his relatives and close friends. And Peter entered his home. Cornelius fell at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter pulled him up and said, Stand up. I'm a human being just like you. So they talked together and went inside where many others were assembled. Peter told them, you know, it's against our laws for a Jewish man to enter a Gentile home like this or to associate with you. But God has shown me that I should no longer think of anyone as impure or unclean. I'm going to repeat that because I want you to get this down. God has shown you and I, even today with these scriptures, that we should no longer think of anyone as impure or unclean. Yet there are denominations out here that will say that if you're not a part of their denomination, you won't see God, you won't see, God, you won't see heaven. 
What are they saying? They're saying if you're not a part of their group, you're unclean. Isn't that sad? But how about if we don't listen to what religion says and we just listen to what God says? So I came without objection as soon as I was sent for. Now tell me why you sent for me. Cornelius replied, four days ago I was praying in my house about this same time, three o'clock in the afternoon. Suddenly a man in dazzling clothes was standing in front of me. He told me, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard and your gifts to the poor have been noticed by God. Now send messengers to Joppa and summon a man named Simon Peter. He's staying in the home of Simon a tanner who lives near the seashore. So I sent for you at once and it was good for you to come. Now we're all here waiting before God to hear the message the Lord has given you. By the way, did you know that's how God still operates? He can speak to you directly or he can speak to you through a man of God. He can speak to you through the word of God. Whenever we come to church and no matter where we're going, we ought to be, have our ears open to what God is going to tell us when we come into that meeting. God, what are you going to tell us today? Amen. When Peter arrived, Cornelius fell at his feet in worship. Peter refused to be treated as a god or to treat Cornelius as if he were a dog, which is what they, he knew in Jewish custom they would call Gentiles dogs. But, but Peter refused to be treated as a god. He knew who the god was or to treat Cornelius as if he were a dog. In, in verse 34, then Peter replied, I see very clearly that God shows no favoritism. In every nation he accepts those who fear him and do what is right. This is the message of good news for the people of Israel. That there is peace with God through Jesus Christ who is Lord of all. You know what happened throughout Judea beginning in Galilee after John began preaching this message of baptism. And you know that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. Then Jesus went around doing good and healing all that were oppressed by the devil for God was with him. And we apostles are witnesses of all that he did throughout Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a cross, but God raised him to life on the third day. Then God allowed him to appear, not to general public, but to us whom God had chosen in advance to be his witnesses. We were those who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he ordered us to preach everywhere and to testify that Jesus is the one appointed by God to be the judge of all, the living... Uh, did you get that? Jesus is appointed by God to be the judge of all, the living and the dead. Not you and I to be the judge of all, but Jesus to be the judge of all. Amen? He's the one all the prophets testified about, saying that everyone who believes in him will have their sins forgiven through his name. Even as Peter was saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell upon all that were listening to the message. The Jewish believers who came with Peter were amazed that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles. For they heard, him, heard them speaking in other tongues and praising God. Then Peter asked, can anyone object to their being baptized now that they've received the Holy Spirit just as we did? So he gave orders for them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And afterward, Cornelius asked him to stay with him for a few days. Let me, I'm going to conclude with this, and we're going to get to doing some baptisms. First of all, this first point, I want you to see this. I want you to understand that it was prayer, focusing on God, on the part of both Peter and Cornelius, that made them receptive to God's leading. Let me ask you this. Is your prayer life good enough and strong enough that God can use to guide you and give you direction? Are you speaking to God? Are you talking to God about things? I find myself better or worse as I pray more or less. It works with mathematical precision. Secondly, the vision that changed the world began by changing one man, by changing Peter. Do you know how often that people say, I'm just one man or I'm just one woman? What difference can I make? Oh, you can make a big difference. But we need to get in line with what, the, to, with loving the way that God loves and caring about people the way that God cares. Amen? We need to be in line with that. And, and the, I told Debbie last night, I said, I wish I'd had the, this idea before 
coming up to preach this message or, or being so late so I couldn't get it done last night because I would have gotten everybody in here today. I would have gotten you a little white napkin to do this with, but I didn't do this. Imagine, if you will, it changed your whole heart and life today if you take Peter and Cornelius home with you and lay them both to heart. If you take a four-cornered napkin when you got home and with pen and ink, write the names. Now, listen to me. Write the names of the nations, the churches, the denominations, the congregations, the ministers, the public figures, the private citizens, the neighbors, the fellow worshipers, all the people you dislike and despise and do not and cannot and will not love. Write their names on that. Heap all their names into your, your napkin and look up and say, Not so, Lord, neither can I speak well nor think well of these people. I cannot do it and I will not try. And if you acted out and spoke all those evil things that are in your heart in some way, you'd get such sight of yourselves that you'd never forget it. We don't want to admit when things are not right with us. But we ought to. One of the things we learn in recovery is we've got to admit that we have a problem. Amen? We can be just as selective as Peter was about who we want to minister and who we want to be around. Do we see people around us as potential believers? Or do we, or do we see them as absolutely unreachable? Have we separated people into the unclean and the clean? Am I going to reach out to this bunch? And it's all in how you were raised and everything. I've been riding motorcycles for a lot of years, and I, and, and um, my, my parents rode, and we, we all rode. But anyway, I remember the time when I was called to minister, and this guy came up to me and said, first thing you need to do is, is uh, back then those people remembered me from years ago. You know, I had real long hair and long beard and stuff. And they told me, said, uh, he said, first thing you need to shave, get cleaned up, and change the way you dress. He said, who would you trust if somebody coming in to talk to you, somebody wearing leather or somebody wearing a suit? I said, I'd trust the man in the leather. <laughs> and he goes, no, you wouldn't. I said, yes, I would, because I know the guy has suits either to arrest me or take my money. So. <laughs> but the reality of it is, is you need to see that you can be used by God right where you are when you decide that you can love people the way that God loves people. When you'll quit putting them into different categories, say, I'll, I'll minister here and I'll love on this person, but I won't love on them. Amen? You know, uh, I know that God already knows our heart. Did you know that God doesn't have to read our Facebook posts to know what's going on with us? We need to get to the place where we really have this, we see that, that God has cleansed humanity of sin. doesn't mean they can't commit a sin, but, but it means this right here, that God's already forgiven them and dealt with that sin. So sin is not what keeps people out of heaven. You know what keeps people out of heaven? Not accepting Jesus as their Savior. Romans 6 says it like this. We know that our old sinful selves are crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We're no longer slaves to sin. Who are you pointing at that you're saying, you know what, I'm not going to hang around that person. That guy's an old sinner. Hebrews 9.12 said, talking about Jesus, said he went once and for all to the Holy of Holies of Heaven, not by virtue of blood of bulls and goats, to make reconcilia uh, reconciliation between God and man, but his own blood, having found and secured a complete redemption and everlasting relief for us. What God did for you, he did for the very people who are offensive to you. What God did for you on that cross, He did for the people you don't want to hang around with. Don't call unclean what God 
has already cleansed. You receive that from the pastor this morning? Real quickly, I want us to stand to our feet.